Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here's your host, Joe Kuzma. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Joe Kuzma, and folks have a special guest joining us today, also by the fine name of Joe, a one Joe Valerio, former offensive lineman with the Kansas City Chiefs in the early to mid-90s, and he comes to us by uh, way of the Believe in Chiefs podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. Joe, how you doing? And thanks for joining us. Hey, Joe, thanks for having me on. Just a couple of Joes in Pennsylvania with a <laughs> cup of Joe here in my hand, uh, you know, t- chopping up some football. I'm really excited about this game. And, you know, I, I'm going to admit this and, and, and my, my Chiefs followers and fans and friends of the organization aren't, aren't going to be happy to hear this. But, you know, I have to admit, growing up in Philadelphia, you know, of course, diehard Eagles fan. It's hard not to be when you're from Philly, you know, especially when you live in the city and was born and raised like I was. Uh, but the Steelers were always, always, and I'm not just placating your Steelers fans, but they were <laughs> always my AFC team. I mean, I could probably name 50 of the 53 guys in those 70s teams, you know, from L.C. Greenwood to Mean Joe Green to Jack Ham, Mel Blunt. You know, Jack Lambert, all the offensive linemen, right? Mike Webster, John Cobb, you name it. I had, you know, Rocky Bly, like, come on. Like it was, th- those teams were royalty, man. That was a great time in Pittsburgh lore. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I mean, myself growing up, I grew up in Northeast Ohio, Joe, and um, Youngstown, Ohio, actually the home of uh, an Edward DeBarlow Jr. on the 49ers. So there were some, uh, during that heyday of the 80s, you know, you got yeah. a little bit of the rub from that as the Steelers and myself growing up, I was, I'm 40, so I was still a, a youngster. And yeah. it's actually, we're going to come around to that. We were just speaking about this um, off the air, but, uh, you know, it might be an end of an era with uh, Ben Roethlisberger here, potentially maybe playing his final game. We see all the jokes, the Kansas City retirement party that's being held. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, you kind of, you roll your eyes and you have some fun with it. Too. Yeah. Although somebody done him up like old man winner and it was just. Like, I oh, saw that on. one. I saw that one. Yeah. Let's like, not get crazy. You know, it's... he's the same age as me. So it's like, come on now. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Give me a little bit of time here but uh yeah one of my one of my earlier memories and being able to watch football as as a youngster you know I'm probably like 11 or 12 at the time at the at the most and you had played for the Kansas City Chiefs during this uh time period where Joe Montana moved from the 49ers and uh, you know everybody was looking at 49ers win and when you were a kid like my age you know that's who you look to you knew all those guys Montana and Rice and Taylor and Roger Craig and you know that's that's who you kind of role played as especially if your team wasn't as good you know what I mean if you wanted to be the best you emulated the best right so you got to play with one of the greats in Joe Montana and one of my memories of course is the game it was the 93 season but played in uh, January in 1994 uh, a game that went into overtime with the final. It was uh, for the longest time uh, until this Patrick Mahomes era. That was the last Chiefs victory, playoff victory at home, at twenty-seven home. to twenty-four uh, over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Tons, tons of Hall of Famers and greats on the field at the same time. Uh, you have any uh, memories that you'd like to share? Since I, I know you said uh, making the rounds here, that game's been yeah. coming up a little bit. So maybe you're a little primed to share some memories from that game. Yeah, no, Joe, it's a great segue and it's something great to talk about because that's what the NFL was made up of, right? The NFL was made up of historic history, historically, you know, relevant games, matchups, you know, rivalries, whatever you want to call it. And that was one of them. I mean, it, it had a lot of uh, intertwinings going on there. I think I just made up a word. Uh, but, you we know, do that often. <laughs> exactly. But when you talk so much, right, in podcasts and things, um, you know, Bill Cower, right, was I, he was I loved him as a coach. He was one of our coaches in Kansas City when I first got there. Right. So I was drafted in 91, had the distinct pleasure of getting to rub elbows with, with, with the great Bill Cower for a couple of years and was fantastic. If the guy used to come down and he would, he would substitute himself in and cover kickoffs when we were all in full pads and he had no uniform on at all. Guy was tough as nails. And I just loved him. He was a player's coach. Uh, but, but, but he also had that incredible amount of respect from his players. He was not a buddy, buddy, 
players coach. He was a real true father figure players coach. So I, I just love the guy. So there you had that, right? You had the mentor and the mentee. Number one, it was Joe Montana in the playoffs at Arrowhead, like all of these things surrounding that game. It's two, you know, organizations that go back, you know, their NFL royalty, I'll call them right with a lot of championship DNA going back to the old Len Dawson chiefs, thinking about some of the things, you know, you and I are talking about with some of these Steeler, his, you know, the history of the Steelers. So it's just, it just had that, it had an aura about it. And what did, what did it give everybody? It gave everybody the chance to go into overtime, right? Like, come on, like it, and it set, it set the cheat. Like my memories of that game, number one are the, are the block punt by, from my good friend, Keith cash, you know, like that really was a turning point in the game. And I was, I was the long snapper on the other side of the ball. So there was nothing worse as a long snapper. When you snap that ball and you go to block and you hear the thud of a ball that is not off the punter's foot, <laughs> my goodness, like that is just utter panic. So I can only imagine what the dread was of that blocking unit when they heard that double thud, boom, boom, right? You hear the thud of the foot and then you hear the thud of the hands and you're like, oh God, and you just turn around and start running. And that to me was like the turning point of the game as, as a long snapper, like, oh God, please don't let that happen to me when the Steelers, you know, if we have to punt <laughs> the ball to the Steelers. So, um, you know, I remember obviously the, the, the touchdown, the fourth, the fourth and goal touchdown pass at the end of the game to Tim Barnett, uh, who was in my draft class. And, you know, we were roommates on the road rookie year and like that was pretty amazing for Timmy to catch that from Joe Montana to win the game. Um, you know, and then, and then, you know, Nick Lowry, one of the all time great kickers, you know, gets an opportunity to win a playoff game, you know, after a storied and long career. So it just had a lot of really cool moments. And I think Joe, and I'm not just saying this because I was on that team that, you know, we had some good teams before Joe Montana got there, not really good teams before the 90s, before Marty got there, right? The Chiefs had struggled for a long time. Marty set the pace and built the foundation for what I think the organization looks like today. And it started with the Christian Okoye, you know, kind of thing where, he, you know, we started building this defense, Derek Thomas, Neil Smith, right? Four Pro Bowl cornerback or four Pro Bowl defensive backs on that squad. And all of a sudden it's building and then Joe gets there. And I'm telling you, I really do believe it set the foundation for all of the success that the Chiefs had. Now, granted, it was the last you know, playoff win at home for the Chiefs. So it was kind of, I wouldn't say that was a sense of pride, <laughs> but it was, <laughs> yeah. it was definitely a sense of like, wow, I was on the last, you know, I was a contributor on the last playoff team that won. So it was really cool. It had, it had a lot of great memories. And you know what? Hey, this one. This one could shape up to be just like that, Joe. I really do. I mean, you know, I heard a great term uh, the other day about the Steelers' chances in this game. And look, I know they're a 12 and a half point underdog, and it's like one of the biggest underdogs. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, I know what it was like to do that. That right after that Steelers game, we were at least a double digit underdog going into the House of Pain and playing the vaunted, you know, 46 defense of Buddy Ryan, the run and shoot offense of Warren Moon. We go down to Houston. And Joe Montana picks them apart. So listen, things can happen. And I heard a great term, you know, the Steelers, you know, look, I'm not going to say I'm just speaking completely objectively and not just being mm -hmm. a Chiefs homer. It's going to be an uphill battle for, for the Steelers. They're going to have just based on the, the last game, based on some of the talent levels that both teams have at this point in the season. But listen, they've got a box. They've got a punch, what I would call a puncher. My dad was a professional boxer, so I love this term. They've got a puncher's chance, you know. You never know in a, in a in a heavyweight championship fight with a huge underdog. He, you know, that underdog contender throws that big right hook, catches catches the champ with a roundhouse. You never know what could happen. So, it's playoffs. So, you know, I, I'm excited yeah. about it from that perspective. Oh, throw playoffs out the window. This season's been completely predictable, right? <laughs> All the way down to the Steelers actually getting in this thing, which is, you know, most of the Steelers fans we saw what happened a few weeks ago. We're, uh, I think we're very realistic on at least you got to play some mistake free football. And if you have to make the game ugly, you got to make it ugly, at least in your own favor. You can't give uh, away three turnovers to Patrick Mahomes and allow the Chiefs to do as they will with the football and, and with short fields as well. Not that they need them, but you can't get into a shootout. And I think right. everyone kind of realizes that. Uh, going back to the historic game, I think the word you're looking for is more memorable than a source of pride necessarily. Because yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't yeah, like I to think. Say, uh, 
yeah, you don't want to think, oh, geez, that's the last thing they won. You know, I'm really happy about that. Nobody's happy about that. You know, we're we're actually kind of pining over here for a playoff win that's been eluding uh, the team yeah. for for a while as well. But the the fact that Mike Tomlin was able to get this team into the postseason and there's been a as he would say a lot of adversity when you have a defensive player of the year like a like a TJ Watt and in fact there's some good parallels here too because um, you know I was saying all the greatness that was on the field you mentioned Bill Cower but uh, your head coach Marty Schottenheimer uh, I don't know maybe long overdue should maybe get a nod here for a busting yeah. Canton perhaps uh, 200 wins and lots of guys who came off that coaching tree as well but I looked at some of the names like Will Shields that was on, uh, on this game too and uh, Marcus Allen you know and Marcus Allen was considered kind of a little over the hill almost at that point if I recall too you know it was they move it kind of from their original team to another team Joe Montana was like 37 38 30 he's in that same age group yeah. as like Ben right now so you got a lot of the same things going now with Ben uh, you got T.J. Watt. You may be experiencing greatness right now. Pa- Patrick Mahomes, of course. Travis Kelsey in a league of his own as a, as a tight end, and the Steelers didn't have to contend with him in the last game too. So it, it's really good to bring the you know the the past and the present together here. Um, of course, we do have to. I have to pause because if I don't remember to do this, you get asked this all the time though. Uh, Joe over here has a dubious distinction of how many receiving touchdowns do you have? <laughs> so I, I ended up, I ended up catching, I ended up with a, with a, a it's an NFL record for linemen. You know, yes. there's some other position groups. I think Mike Rabel is, is up there as a linebacker, but as an offensive lineman, you know, it was, it was a, a, a an NFL tying record with uh, Anthony Munoz with four, four touchdowns okay. as, four. A ta- as a, as a, as a tackle eligible three from Joe, which, you know, I mean, look, it's like you, you were talking earlier about the, you know, how we all emulated those 49ers teams. If you grew up in that era, right. And who didn't picture themselves making the catch, right. Dwight, the Dwight Clark, Joe Montana connection in, in the NFC championship game. Like who didn't want to do that? You're on, either on the beach at the park and, you know, in your backyard and you're, and you're, you're jumping up like Dwight Clark and you're catching that ball. And like to see Joe Montana on the other end for me was I mean, it, I, I still, sometimes I pinch myself. Like, did that really happen? Like, did, was that a fever dream? You know, that I just like, that I dreamt that Joe Montana threw me some touchdowns. Like my dad used to joke all the time. He said, oh, I, I knew you were going to make it to the hall of fame, son. I just didn't think it would be on somebody else's plaque. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> but hey, you know, it, any way you get there, man, any way cool, you can get right? to Canton, but you know, it was, it was, yeah. And, and, and the fun, the crazy thing about them is they were always in these incredibly, like awesome games. Like my first touchdown was against the Raiders, which every Chiefs wants to do something good against the Raiders because of that that rivalry that goes back well, many, many, we'll many, take many, that many too. Years. You know, there's some a little bit of animosity there in the seventies yeah, with the Raiders. Exactly. Well. <laughs> so you know, and then and then and then to back it up with the one in the 49ers game with the Joe Montana Steve Young rematch at Arrowhead in 1994, like to catch the one in that game, and then to do it on Monday Night Football in in against the Broncos in probably what they say is the number one or number two to three, they'll call it best Monday night football games in history, which was the Elway Montana shootout that came down to the last second for both teams. You know, we scored with barely any time left, but we gave Elway just enough time left to try to do something. It was the first time Marty had ever won at mile high in his career. And so like, you know, to hear, you know, Al Michaels and Dan Deardorff say your name. Like I, as soon as I got home that night, it was like three o'clock in the morning. I said to my wife, I said, did you tape the game? And she goes, oh, yeah, I think I did. So I said, great. We got to listen. We got to play it. She said, it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, you got to be at the, you got to be at the, you got to be at the field tomorrow at 8 a.m. for stretching and treatment. And I was like, I know, but I got to hear Al Michaels say my name. <laughs> like, she's like, you're crazy. But, you know, I was just living every lineman's dream. But it, but it was, it was a lot of fun to have that distinction and, and to, to, to give, to give to the team whatever, whatever I could, wherever I could. Yeah. And I bet seeing Robert Hunt, it didn't count, but I bet it brought back some good memories seeing him uh, almost rumble and score there with the Dolphins earlier in the season, too. Yeah, so, exactly. Hey, you exactly. know, linemen don't get to touch it too much. You know, I used to do the same thing with the buddy I was involved with pro wrestling, and we would get in maybe at like 2 in the morning as well, um, have a camcorder maybe set up and recording matches and whatnot, and we're popping them in, same thing, yeah. late at night, man. It was just, yeah. it was just wired a different way. You don't want to yeah. go to sleep. And, exactly. Uh, you know, even watching these games as fans, 
fans. Um, even just last week, it was just, you know, I was under the weather, but still it was like, man, I'm like, I'm like popped up on adrenaline. Like, and, uh, I did doze off though during the, uh, chargers and Raiders game. And I, I think, did too. And then Chris Collinsworth may have woken me up <laughs> going crazy. Right. His overtime. Sorry. I'm like, why are they kicking off? What's going on here? Yeah. I thought maybe, yeah. you know, I, I couldn't help it. I wasn't feeling well. All right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just like pins and needles and then I couldn't fall back asleep, of course. But, uh, getting to this game specifically, I mean, there's all kinds of great stuff over the years. I'll have to have you back on maybe during the summer, just uh, maybe. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, do do some reminiscing, uh, some old school football, and that. It was just I've been in it. I was in a unique opportunity earlier this year to speak with Monty Ball, who played uh, with the Denver Broncos, running back, uh, and sure. Peyton Manning's last year there too. So it's kind of like all these things kind of coming together here and you know I like to pick some brains and things like that I don't know that you necessarily ever count out a team with Ben Roethlisberger as quarterback I don't care if he's 50 years old you know what I mean he's just like Elway no, you he's can't. One, of, one of those guys that uh, just leads the NFL all time in in game winning drives and comebacks but still he's got to hope to keep this close you know I look at this, you mentioned already 12 and a half, depending on where you look, 12. Uh, I think yeah. it was 14 and a half where it opened. 46 and a half is the over under I'm seeing right now, depending on the line that you're looking at. And the Steelers yeah. have not been much of an offensive firepower <laughs> team. And that's that's the part that more or less concerns me. You can't, I mentioned earlier, you can't get into a shootout with uh, Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy and their whole offensive philosophy there. You've got Travis Kelsey. There are some injuries. We'll see if Tra- uh, Tyreek Hill uh, mm-hmm. ends up with that heel injury that he hurt or sustained in the pregame of the last game. We'll see how he ends up being. But, uh, you know, uh, I, w- I was having this argument just a little bit ago with one of my cousins, and it's like, well, Clyde edwards Lair, maybe he could be back, Daryl Williams, uh, how you know, these guys might be a little banged up. And I said, you know what? I don't know that it necessarily matters as much. The Steelers have been bad against the run, but I I've seen enough from the chiefs to know that Andy Reed can just throw someone else out there, get exactly just the little bit that he needs where the Steelers have been weak against. If they let off like a big run uh, anywhere in this game, let's say another one like to Latavius Murray last week, that was around 50 yards. And for a touchdown, that's going to be the absolute killer. You're, you're at your best. You're going to try and limit Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey. We'll see what happens with Tyreek Hill and some of the others. But how do you feel about maybe the Chiefs complementing that, uh, you know, the, the course of action if you're the Chiefs offense against the Steelers defense? Well, yeah, Joe, my, my hope all year long has been that the Chiefs will, would try to run the ball until somebody stopped them. They They tend to let the magic of their passing games sometimes get in the way um, because it, 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 it is so unique. You know, the way that they stretch the field horizontally, right? If you watch their pass patterns, they, I, I call Travis Kelsey, like I call him like the center on a basketball team and I, they post him up a lot, right? They, they just post him up. Now, granted, he's very mobile as well, but he's like your post up center. And then everything is happening. Like a lot of it's happening horizontally. And, and that's one thing that the chiefs offense has really been very strategic with is using the speed of their receiving core. Right. And because until they picked up Josh Gordon, they didn't really have, they never really had a Terrell Owens or like a Randy Moss type big receiver, right. To, 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 to throw those back shoulder out routes, uh, to throw the fades into the end zone. Like they don't really have that until they picked up Josh Gordon and, and he's made some impact, but not enough. So what they did is rather than, than trying to always beat you deep with their speed, they have a very unique way of beating you horizontally with their speed and how they do that is, you know, obviously, like I said, they post Travis up, they let, the receivers run at that like eight to 12 yard range. So they're not like going deep, right? You don't see the chiefs throw. I mean, even though Mahomes has an arm, he, they don't, you don't see them throw a lot of bombs. Um, and they have had a very uh, unique way of getting themselves into almost like, I don't want to say they're like, it's, it's like an extended running game, but their passes are very methodical. And I think that's what's really hard to stop. It's it's really hard to cover the field, you know, 50 plus yards horizontally um, when you're kind of used to, you know, stopping the run and then you want to stop the big, big deep ball. But like the 
Chiefs are really, really good at that. And 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 what what, what complements it is Patrick Mahomes' ability to what I call step up, and he finds the pocket within the pocket. Like if I were the Steelers, I would rush, I would rush the the um, the interior of the pocket and always try to force him left. So I would like, it's not that you're spying him, like you don't want to spy him and give him too much time, but you want to rush in a way that is like, it's like an old revolutionary war tactic where, you know, you'd see the British army or the old revolutionary American army, like march down the field, like, like that's the way you need to rush him, get in his face, get his field of vision and keep him moving to his left. Because when you do a traditional rush where you got your ends and, you know, you got the TJ Watts of the world rushing wide up the field and you got your, you know, you got your two defensive tackles, either twisting or stunting or trying to do something. Patrick has an uncanny way of just finding that little opening in the pocket, stepping up and giving his receivers that one extra second they need to bust the zone or the man defense Again, using that term, stretching the field horizontally. So that's something I would tell Steelers fans to watch for. How are the Chiefs or how are the Steelers rushing the Chiefs? How are they keeping Patrick in the pocket? And how are they moving him to his left? Because he's a little less effective to his left than he is to his right. And, you know, that's what they're going to do. So what I would expect from the Chiefs, look, I'm no offensive coordinator in the NFL, um, <laughs> but if I were, if it were me, I'd, I'd run the ball until the till the Steelers stop it, you know, and yeah. I would run right at TJ Watt because, you know, that's the way, like I, I was talking to somebody about this or like, how, do, how did people used to run against the chiefs when you were there? Because we had always either the top, it was always a top three defense in the AFC, if not the whole NFL, Derek Thomas, Neil Smith, Dan Salamua, incredible linebacking core four pro bowl corner or two pro bowl corners and two pro bowl safeties. I mean, we were stout on defense and, I always said that the way that teams beat us is they ran at guys like Derek Thomas. So if I'm the Chiefs, I'm running right at TJ, double team him, wear him down so it slows him down in the passing game, and just run the ball till till they stop him. Because when you run the ball, like and of course this is coming from a lineman who loves to run block, mm-hmm. right? But like I've always been a big fan that it opens your playbook up when you can establish the running game because then you're then you've got play action, you've got your screen game, you've got your mid to short range passing, which is kind of like an extension of your run game. Like you got your, your running backs because you know, Daryl Williams is really effective coming out of the backfield. Gore is really effective coming out of the backfield. Clyde very effective coming out of the backfield. So it just, it just opens everything up rather than trying to go for the pass right away and, and put a team away. So anyway, that's my two, my two analysis on what I, what I would give fans a, a, a uh, something to look at as they as they watch this game progress through the first half. Oh no, that's all great stuff. I was looking up Derek Gore. Uh, he had actually it wasn't even just the run, but he was averaging three six. He had twelve for forty three. Williams had eleven for fifty five in the last game. Uh, Clyde Edwards Alaire only nine to twenty seven, but also got that's the game he got hurt. So. Uh, they topped the hundred. I don't know that the Steelers are really effective at keeping anyone under a hundred right now. Uh, but it's you know Patrick Mahomes, perfect football, uh, almost twenty three of thirty. He didn't have to throw a whole lot. Seventy six point yeah. seven completed. I mean, it's just that's insane for two fifty eight. The three touchdowns, no picks, one thirty five point one rating. And it's two guys like Byron Pringle for yeah. six for 75, uh, Derek Gore, three for 61, you know, out of the backfield. Yeah. McCole Hardman, who is like basically a clone of Tyreek Hill. Uh, you got a lot of these same shifty kind of yeah. players. I mean, Tyreek Hill was only two for 19 in that game. So and the Steelers got to be careful on offense, I think particularly we yeah. got to see if Najee Harris is going to get on the field. That's a big component of uh, what that's they do. Huge. Yeah, obviously uh, that's why he was the top overall pick, uh, but we'll see. They've been kind of nursing him all week. I think he'll be a game time decision regardless. Uh, I know he hasn't practiced the last two days, but uh, I very, very highly doubt that they're going to let him sit at home when all the chips are on the table. Uh, another surprise on the Steelers side that could help some reinforcements, perhaps Juju Smith Schuster, uh, mm-hmm. injured since I believe week five, maybe week six out of nowhere practicing now and looks like from all indications with an attempt to play, 
I know some people think that's crazy. Oh, he's maybe not in football shape. He hasn't caught a ball and yada, yada, yada. Hey, look, if he gets out there for like 15 snaps, I think it's still a difference maker. He's a guy that's physical and he's capable of moving the chains. That's where he made his bread and butter last year. And that's basically the big thing for the Steelers offense is you can't go three and out. Uh, you know, if you want any shot of the of your defense holding up against the likes of Mahomes yeah. and company, and I still think, in my opinion, Travis Kelsey, he's gonna get he's gonna get what he's gonna get. Uh, you mm-hmm. don't want him to have like a buck fifty and two touchdowns, but if you could hold him to a handful of catches in the sixty ish range, I think you're still doing yourself a, a service there instead of a disservice. So uh, we'll see. Typically, that has been the duties of Terrell Edmonds, one of the Steelers' safeties. I think they're <clears> a little stronger in the secondary coming over this back end of the the season. And the, and the thing is that when you're looking at this and you're trying to say, well, did they have a chance? You know what I mean? The yeah. offense has got to do something. And you've seen the offense just come out of nowhere and do whatever. But a lot of times they're trailing big. They're running hurry up stuff. And uh, a lot of fans don't understand. You can't go again into the shootout mentality. You run a hurry up offense and score real quick against Kansas City. They're just going to come back and do the same exact thing to you. If it fails and you go three and out, the defense is going to be gassed, and and then you can chip away at the run game and things of that nature. So we'll see, we'll yeah, see what Ben and, Roethlisberger and company could do here. <laughs> and Joe, they can't, they can't, they can't turn over the ball. I mean, they had three turnovers yeah. in that game. I mean, they didn't, they didn't. The Steelers didn't really even give themselves a chance. I mean, if you looked at just the stat line, it wasn't like it wasn't abysmal. I mean, it wasn't. You know, they 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 went toe to toe on first downs. Um, you know, they, they had a decent average, you know, they, you know, of, uh, of rushing, you know, running the ball, like an average yard, you know, per rush. I mean, you get, when you're getting five and a half yards of carry, you know, you can set yourself up for second and five and third and two and things like that. So, you know, if, if they, maybe it's a different game if they eliminate some of the turnovers. Right. I mean, and, and like you said, the time of possession is really what was crazy in that game. I mean, the chiefs out, outpace them by 10 minutes and that's a lot of that's a lot of possessions that's a lot of opportunities to score that's a lot of your defense just getting worn down and getting tired it's tough to play defense I mean I and I, and I say this with all all due respect to both sides of the ball playing defensive line and linebacker is a lot more tiring than playing offense um, it, it just, it just, I just know it is. I mean, it, even don't, I mean, I hadn't played defense since I was in high school, but like in the NFL, you know, playing a full game, um, you know, you, you obviously were never as gassed as a lineman, even in a hurry up situation than the D linemen are, because, you know, the D linemen are just, they're just doing different things. They're, it's different body movements. It's different positioning and, and, and it's really exhausting to rush the passer and to try to stop the run play after play after play. I mean, you hear it all the time, but you know, that's, that's something that you can't, you know, it's tough, it's tough to, it's really, really tough to win a game when, when your defense just gets worn down. And, and that's what, you know, you, you nailed it. Like if they can just find a way to have fewer three and outs, not turn over the ball again, there you go back to that sort of, you know, punchers mentality that maybe there's a roundhouse in there that happens in this game that, you know, pull something a little bit closer, closer for the Steelers. And, um, you know, one thing that, that got, got the Steelers in that game too, is that if you look at the average yards per, per pass, I mean, the chiefs averaged just right at eight, 7.9 yards per pass. And that's exactly where they need to be. Um, and that's why they, they are so effective in the passing game. Cause it's not the 20, 30 yard catch. It's they, now they have some pretty elusive receivers who can make more yards after the catch, but that, when you look at where, where Patrick Mahomes is targeting his guys, it's always in that five to 15 yard range. And it's just, it's just so much easier to, to, to pick apart a defense. And I think that's what, you know, Eric B has been, has been really good at. Okay. I'm going to have to pick your brain on something yeah. else. And uh, you know, before I do that, I want to, I got to go back to that game one more time. Cause I didn't mention some of the Steelers greats that were in that oh, game. God, like they were Kevin green, Rod Woodson oh. and Dermani Dawson and got oh. lot, some gold jackets there. I think I saw at least without coaches uh, at least like six or seven when you combine both sides of the ball. But um, 
Neil O'Donnell, a name that we forbid to be mentioned on this show for Super Bowl <laughs> reasons, actually outdueled Joe Montana in that game with a better quarterback rating and three touchdown passes. So uh, never say never, you know what I mean? It's a, No one would ever think going back on that. It's like, well, you know, and but Joe Montana got him where it counts in the win column. But um, one that I've been debating on here. How uh, this uh, this is going to be an insert foot in my own mouth because I'm asking someone from the Chiefs. There was a trade in the middle of this season for a particular edge defender, uh, edge rusher, Melvin Ingram. And I just kind of want to hear some insights on how you feel that as he helped the Chiefs defense and in what ways do you feel he's helped the Chiefs defense? Well, I mean, he's, you know, look, obviously he made that huge play uh, against the Broncos, right? I mean, Un- he's unblocked too. just they just yeah. no hat on hat there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, he's he's he brings a level of energy um, to to the squad. Um, and and and, you know, I, I you, just, you hate to say it that, um, you know, you, you hate to say it, but you know, the chiefs were really struggling in the first half of the season on defense and they needed a shot in the arm. They needed a B12 shot to really, you know, get, get them going. And, and I think, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I, I love, you know, I think Frank Clark from, from a historical perspective has, has had his moments, right. He has had his moments of, of shine, but he just, you know, he's been, hasn't really been as effective. You know, they, 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 they experimented with the, the, the great Chris Jones experiment, right. And moving him to the interior where they felt like they could get a better rush out of him than sometimes that he rushes on the interior. But I, I think what, you know, when you, when you bring on a competitor like that, it's, it's that kind of energy that this defense really needed. Um, and I, I think that's, I think that's really what he, what he really brings to brings to the team. Um, you know, it's that sort of leadership, uh, you know, some, what I think that was that one term that Travis Kelsey may have said it, it was a, something that, uh, what God rest his soul, uh, um, Therese, uh, Paler, uh, who, who passed away, it was a sports writer, you know, the ju- juice man, right? I think that's what uh, you know. Travis Kelsey was kind of alluding to something that Therese P- Taylor, Therese Paler, who wrote for the Chiefs for many years, um, who who's tragically passed away this year, like used to say, you know, he has the goods. He's the juice man, and that's kind of like what what Melvin Ingram brings to the Chiefs defense, and it seems to be it seems to be working the way that Steve Spagnuolo is using him. Yeah, and it's just it's a curiosity because it's a back and forth, and I'm guilty of more glass half empty because he's a guy who, you know, wanted his way out of Pittsburgh. So I'll have yeah. my little saltiness over that too. But statistically, I just didn't see him as much on the box score. Now, obviously, I saw it in the game uh, with the Broncos last week. I was watching that one. I got my eyes glued a lot of times on these different things. Got I actually got quite a few friends that are Chiefs fans too, so I can't. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of bad things to necessarily say about Kansas City. As you said, old guard, Lamar Hunt, uh, legendary ownership, and, and things of that nature. Uh, definitely, definitely going to be, I, I think, hopefully a classic battle. I, I want to see a game. I don't want to see what I was anticipating several weeks ago was not a game. I didn't think it would be a game and it wasn't a game for very long. In fact, Mason Rudolph got to come in and there was a lot of backups. Chad, I think Chad Henney came in too. Did he not? Mm-hmm. He uh, did, yeah. yeah. Or, or no, maybe he didn't. Uh, no. Well, he didn't attempt to pass maybe. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't want to see that necessarily. And I know there's some folks, you get some of the uh, guys who breathe hot air, on TV, like a Nick Wright, and he says this is basically a bye week. And if I were the Chiefs, I would sit all kind of players, and I'm just like, well, whoa, these are still playoff teams we're talking about here. I understand that maybe the Steelers are in a historic category because, you know, Ben Roethlisberger said it sarcastically, we're not supposed to be here. <laughs> so we're just going to go out and have fun. I think that's kind of, if you're, uh, you know, Kansas City, I'm not going to say that an Andy Reid team is going to overlook anyone, but stranger things have happened. You know, as we said, it's an any given Sunday kind of thing. The Steelers don't have anything to lose. I think they could be dangerous. It's just unfortunate from where I'm sitting that I would much rather be seeing this 
against maybe anyone else in the AFC field here other than the Kansas City Chiefs who've been the three straight uh, conference championship games in the last two Super Bowls. So does this game make you a little bit nervous, maybe, perhaps? Listen, it's the playoffs. It's Mike. <laughs> it's a Mike Tomlin coach team with, you know, championship big game DNA. And you got Big Ben, who's, you know, it, it, he's he's – he's out there, you know, looking at, at his swan song season. And of course it does. Of course it does. I mean, anything can happen in this league, a couple of bad bounces, uh, you know, a special teams uh, snafu or guffaw. And next thing, you know, you know, the chiefs could be down seven, you know, I, you just, you just never know in this league. And, and, and Marty coach Schottenheimer used to tell us all the time, in the playoffs, the fit starts getting really tight at the top and it just gets tighter and tighter the further you go. And we're, we're all right. So right now we're at the base of that pyramid, right? Where you've eliminated the bottom half of the pyramid of the teams that have been, you know, struggled and had their ups and downs. And now you've got the teams that have, have risen to the challenge of being able to make it to, you know, the top echelon of, of this sort of playoff picture. And to me, that says it all. You know, because the Chiefs are not 20-0. and 0. Um, They haven't won all of their games. They've lost some games they should have won. And, you know, it, it, it it's, it's just you got to just, okay, on paper, should the Chiefs win? You know, Vegas gets it right a lot of the time. They, they kind of <laughs> yes, know do. what those lines are. And that's the reason why there's a lot of – super, you know, uh, educated professionals in that arena, right. Of, of sports betting and gambling. And they, they, they do their homework. So yeah, the odds are telling you that it should on paper, but NFL games, Joe, are not played on paper. They're, they're played on the field, human beings, uh, competitors, and it's the playoffs. So anything could happen. This game could turn out. The chiefs could crush that line and beat the Steelers, Maybe the same way that that happened, uh, you know, in week 16, that could happen. The Steelers could come out and return the opening kickoff for a touchdown, put the Chiefs behind. The Chiefs could press. The Steelers could run the ball effectively. And it, it, the, the Steelers could win, you know, 14 to three. <laughs> like, you just ne- you, like, you just never know. I mean, I've seen it. I've been there. Like, I did it. I was, I was on one end of it when we beat the Oilers as a huge underdog. I was also involved in, in the season and in a game where we were we were the Chiefs in this particular game. And the Steelers might have just been a different name called the Indianapolis Colts. And, you know, we, you know, we, we were probably a double digit on, uh, favorite against them in 1990. What was the 95 season? It, you know, it was January of 96. We had the bye. Marty was fantastic coming off of bye weeks. We had the game plan. And you know what? It, it was, it, first of all, it was, I think it was 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. I think the wind chill was in the negatives. We had a kicker who missed three field goals. We had a first time playoff quarterback in Steve Bono. We went away from our game plan and we, we started throwing and airing the ball out in the most frigid of weather, even though we had rushed the ball for, you know, Marcus was averaging five yards to carry in the first half, but we were losing like 10 to three or something at halftime or six, nothing. I can't remember what the score was. We ended up losing that game to, to, to Indianapolis. So that was probably the most mentally close I've ever been to the Super Bowl. We were, we were more physically close when we lost in the AFC championship game to Buffalo in 93 the 93 season, but that season was the most mentally close that the chiefs organization had been to the super bowl since the Len Dawson era. And, you know, we had home field throughout, we were coming off a bye. We were looking forward to the Steelers coming back to Arrowhead to play us. Um, and then ultimately, you know, Indianapolis had to play the Steelers on the road and then, and then the Steelers won that game. Um, but like, you know, you just never know, Joe. And I'm not I'm not just placating Steelers fans and, you know, kind of like walking oh, the yeah. fence because because I do truly believe on paper. And if you just had to go like just looking at the way the season has progressed, that the Chiefs should be a favorite in this game. But I'll cap it off with saying you never know. And those are great parallels, because back in the 2005 season, and the Steelers went into Indianapolis and won a game that they had no business winning as well with Peyton Manning and company and uh, also Mike Vanderjat 
missing a field goal in that game uh, that, you know, uh, a lot of things. The ball bounces the right way. Steelers sneak in as the last seed. They go all the way and uh, run the table and win the whole thing. So, and I know people have been trying to make some comparisons there, and it's like um, you can and you can't. You know what I mean? Yeah, you got to yeah, wait yeah. until the story's actually told here because, um, yeah, you got some Hall of Fame players there, like maybe a Troy Polamalu and some all-time greats and things like that, but. Uh, at the same aspect, you never know. You know, TJ's writing his story too, and it might be Ben's yeah. swan song. You know, it, you just never know what can happen. So, um, at least you know, if you're a Steelers fan, I didn't want them so depressed walking out of this podcast. Joe over here just said there's no chance. Our Joe said there's no chance. Don't even turn the game on on Sunday. No, it's <laughs> that is the. I would never say that in a million years, and yeah. and, and, and 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 only because you know, and I, I'm not trying to like uh, you know. Uh, just you know use my my former player status to be able to say that but as a player you never could have that mentality i mean that's something that coach schottenheimer drilled into us you never think you're going to win a game by throwing your helmet out there you just you know because the pay it's all paper you know and because it's like i said it's it's human beings it's competitive people playing a game uh that means a lot to them so that is the last thing that I ever have believed, no matter how much talent was on one side of the ball. If you don't prepare and you don't get ready and you don't aren't mentally, physically and emotionally prepared to play that game, anything can happen. And that's and that's the element that makes it fun. You know, I mean, look at look at the fact that, this, the, you know, some of the facts around why the Steelers are in. You know, Indianapolis, you know, the Colts needed to win, what, two of the last three games or something like that. I mean. Mm-hmm. And, and, or one of them, I'm sorry, they needed to win one of those last uh, two games, right? They just needed to either win the week before or beat the Jaguars. And it's kind of like, it reminds me of when, when the, um, the chiefs won the super bowl and, you know, everybody's thinking, oh, well, I guess we're just going to have that number two seed and, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, Fitz magic, right. Brian Fitzpatrick has the game of his life against the Patriots and, it vaults the chiefs into the number one seat and puts them in the driver's seat. So, you know, crazy stuff happens. And, um, you know, that's, that's what makes it fun. I just, you know, I, I, I gotta say, cause I, you know, I want to be able to still carry my Pittsburgh card and head out there and get myself a <laughs> Permani brother sandwich. You know, I, well, I used to cover, I used to cover Pittsburgh a lot, uh, for work in the work that I do today. Um, and I was always in Pittsburgh at least once every two or three weeks. And I'd always grab my Primanti brothers and we have a lot of family in Pittsburgh. My wife's, uh, mom's family. My mother-in-law, uh, is, is from Pittsburgh, uh, grew up in the Coriopolis area. My uncle, uh, in law still lives in Coriopolis. So, you know, we have a lot of ties to Pittsburgh. Her grandparents met on the roller coaster at Kennywood. Oh, wow. At, at a school picnic. <laughs> and, 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 you know, then they had like, you know, six kids later and all these grandkids. So, you know, Pittsburgh's a great place and it's a great city. It's got so much tradition and, and history. Um, you know, it's it, one, one of Pittsburgh connection for me, probably the the closest Pittsburgh connection from a sports perspective is uh, my be- best friend in, in high school. We played baseball together and we were friends from the time we were like, what, seven, eight years old. Uh, his grandfather was Danny Murtaugh. So the, the manager of the championship, two-time championship pirates and Danny's from my hometown. So here in Philadelphia area. So, um, you know, just there's just so many connections to the city. I just love it. I love it. I love Pittsburgh and I, I want this to be a good game for everybody and a good game for the NFL. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's one of those small world things too. And, um, just going even to full circle, even from my hometown in, in Youngstown, some of my family over in Western Pennsylvania, mainly Newcastle area, um, the same thing. It's like you you could go anywhere. I was up in Green Bay this year and bumped into someone who graduated the same year, same high school as my wife that's living oh, wow. up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It was just the wow. craziest thing. Yeah, I'm in the middle of all of these Packers fans tailgating, and you bump into somebody that's like that close. I don't know him personally, but you know what I mean? Uh, maybe he's listening, and uh, sorry, I forget your name, but the beer was excellent that you gave me. Yeah, so there thank you go. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Joe, uh, I don't think anybody's going to revoke your card uh, anytime soon and um it's always fun having these stories and that and by the way you went to penn correct yes yes yeah, went beautiful to campus i've been there too so it's like another small world type thing so yeah uh, so it's funny it, it was funny joe my my uh you know you know going to school at penn i always joke i you know 
six months earlier, I was blocking Biff McNutty from Harvard. And then I was going against Howie Long and Reggie White. Like, some, I was like, what just happened? Like, that was a cra- <laughs> crazy transition. I'll never forget. Funny story. Neil Smith was our defensive, you know, Hall of, well, future, hopefully future Hall. Of, we'll see. But unbelievable defensive end for us and uh, went to Nebraska. And Penn was playing Nebraska in the 94 uh, March Madness tournament. And I knew that the Penn 94 team, you know, coming out of the Ivy League was going to be special in the tournament because they had two future NBA players on that team that I had gotten to know while I was there when they were younger, when I was graduating. And I just had a feeling they were going to beat Nebraska and and Nebraska was going to look past them. And so Neil says, Hey, I heard somebody told me our schools are playing each other in a tournament. You want to bet? I said, yeah, let's bet. And he said, he said, I said, you're on Neil. I said, you're on. Cause I kind of knew they were going to win, even though they were an 11 seed and and Nebraska was a five seed and um, Penn won. And he comes in the next day into the weight room uh, because it was off season workout time. And he goes, Joe, here's your hundred dollars that you won in the bet. And he goes, by the way, he called me little buddy. He's like, little buddy. He's like, what's a Quaker? Like, what's a Penn Quaker? <laughs> and I said, well, Neil, I said, he goes, I thought you went to Penn state. He goes, I thought we were playing oh. Penn state. And I, and I was like, well, Neil, yeah, that, you know, that he might've bet know. you more money if he actually had known that <laughs> fact. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. So got more it, out it, of was, him. it was, it was hysterical. So anyway, but that's my, my funny pen pen Quaker story and, and how it connects to the Chiefs. But, but yeah, so it was, uh, it, it was a fun, a fun transition to, to come out of there and to get to rub elbows with with some some real great players from some great schools. Absolutely. Well, folks, uh, you've heard it from uh, Believe in Chiefs podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. Joe Valerio, former uh, kind of jack-of-all-trades along the offensive line uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, Joe also did a, uh, a pregame with uh, with Cam Rogers over there as well. If you want to get a little even more detailed into this um, Chiefs Steelers game and maybe hear a couple other perspectives uh, that we may not have shared here. And you could also follow Joe at Joe Valerio 73 on Twitter. That's, That's yeah. yeah, you officially yeah. there. I had to look you up. Uh, so uh, by all means, check it out. And uh, any any parting words, uh, anything that you would like to share? Absolutely open floor for you, sir. Oh, Joe, it was great to join you. I, I you know, really was a, a blast just chatting and, and making these connections about this game. I think this is, you know, I, I think this year was, if you pull back, you know, and look under the hood at this season in the NFL, just take off your fan hat for a second. Um, whether you follow the Chiefs, the Steelers, the Broncos, the, whoever you follow and take a look at how cool this season was and, and the parody and the, how there were what 16, 18 or something teams in the last couple of weeks that still had a shot at the playoffs. Um, look at the rivalries that are still in place and the ones that are being created. I think this was a great season for a, just a football fan. You know, look, I know there's a lot of disappointed fans out there whose team didn't go to the playoffs, but I hope win, lose or draw in this game. Well, there won't be any draws now because it's playoffs, but, (laughs) you know, win or lose this game. Take a look at at this season and really, really understand what an awesome season it was to be a football fan and to watch the way that um, teams really were battling till the end. And I I just think that's a great thing for a football fan to, to every day you turn on a game. And watch and say, oh, I'm, I'm probably going to be watching a really good game. Like, who didn't, you know, if you were like you and I were joking, you know, everybody's dozing off during that Chargers Raiders game, right? What a crazy game that was, right? Yeah. I can't and you do don't even have anymore. to, <laughs> you don't have to, you don't even have to know what the heck is going on in the AFC West to know that that was a really good game. And these rivalries that are being built and, 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 and further today really is laying the foundation for, I think, what is going to be great future seasons, you know, based on what we've seen this year. And, and I just think that's a really good thing for, for sports. It's a great thing for football. They're, they're making all the right rule changes to make it exciting for fans, but still keep the safety of the players in mind. Um, and I, I just, I just, I'm just glad to be able to, to share that. So thanks, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I was going to ask you if you had a preference, if that game ended in a tie, <laughs> it would have been, uh, would have been the Raiders or who would you have had the Raiders or the Chargers? I think I, I someone Raiders, told me it would have. I think Raiders? I think you're. I think it. I don't. Someone told me it was a. I don't even know to tell you the truth. <laughs> I, I gotta be honest. I know. I, I I'm gonna be. And I, this is gonna sound like a slight 
to the Pittsburgh fans. And I no, don't, no, I don't, no, because I, I would say I the same thing here. I don't mean it to be. I it's it's you know I, I think there's two other matchups this year where teams have played three times right or this will be their third time but Bills and Patriots right mm-hmm. this is their third time and then um um uh, who uh, the Rams and uh oh God remind me I'm not having a brain fry it's Friday who are the Rams playing They're, yeah and I and I just closed it too so hold on one the, second wh- whoever the Rams are playing it's their third time meeting this year I believe right I think I saw that stat somewhere Rams and Cardinals yeah division yeah so uh, they play, opponents so they've played three times like that scares the living daylights out of you as a player as a coach as a fan like I I I'm so even though you know the, the Steelers and, and and the Chiefs have played each other once, and you don't want to give Mike Tomlin any more film to watch than than he needs, which I think gives the you know the Steelers a little bit you know of a you know that's one of the reasons why this could go any direction uh, in this game. But again, no slight to the Steelers fans, but I, I just would have hated to have to play somebody three times, and and because it's hard, it's really really hard to beat somebody multiple times in a season, and that division rivalry would have made it worse, I think, for the Chiefs in preparation. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, you don't have to slight anyone as far as saying this. I think most of us didn't have uh, – look, you had to count on Jacksonville to beat the Colts. <laughs> Although it had happened in five or six prior meetings, I don't think that Indianapolis has won down there since like 2014 or something ridiculous. You still weren't counting on it based on the yeah. way that the Jaguars – went. I mean, they fired their coach. I mean, they've, they've just been a dumpster fire the whole year right. long. And they go and they blow the doors off of Indianapolis, which I feel bad. I have some friends that are some Colts fans too. I feel I've, I felt for them, but not too much. I, th- I did right. say thank you. I said yeah. thank Thank you. You know, your loss is my gain, so I'm not going to feel too bad. And one more note on the parody thing, too. Yeah, you have a lot to be concerned with there because just like the AFC North with the Steelers, okay, Cincinnati wins 10 games, Steelers win 9, the Browns and the Ravens are both 8-win teams. I mean, the Browns and Bengals are back in this thing, too. In the West, yeah, Kansas City's been winning all of this, but the Raiders are back in the playoffs now, a 10-win team. The Chargers just missed out with nine. The Broncos win seven games. They're not too far off pace there. They're, you know, they're still looking for their quarterback. But, yeah, a lot of parity in the NFL, and those two divisions uh, in particular. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. when I take a look at Buffalo, yeah, Buffalo's back, okay? The Patriots, then you look, and they're still the Jets. They still got the <laughs> Jets over yeah, there. Yeah, so, it's yeah. you know, it's one of those things. But, Joe, uh, great name, by the way. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Uh, very right much appreciate you, it. Great, great conversation. Joe asked me earlier, how long you th- you know, how – how long do you need me for? And I said, well, I don't know. We get talking. You never know how long we'll talk. You never and know. It's just uh, great to talk football. Uh, football is family, and it's just a very large community. And you get going, and you got all these little small strings of everything that's interconnected, and they're very great stories. Um, once again, folks, don't forget to uh, check them out. Joe Valerio, 73. I yep. think, and on Twitter, and the Believe in Chiefs podcast as well. So uh, that'll do it for us. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we close out the show, Joe, all these uh, various many different ways. But usually I tell each and every one of our supporters out there to um, stay tuned until next time. And be safe, be good, and we'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 